Well, um, we're beginning a brand new series here today. We just have finished up in the book of Habakkuk, where we saw the prophet dialoguing with God through these three chapters. And initially, he didn't like the answer that the Lord gave him about why there was so much wickedness going on and God seeming, seeming in action. And God told him, no, this, I've got a plan here. And by the time the book ends, Habakkuk is like, I'm, I'm on board with you, Lord. And his faith uh, was in the Lord. He went from fear to faith. Now, this month, November, we're taking a little different approach. We're not preaching through a book this month. We're going to cover some of the difficult passages in Scripture and concepts in Scripture that tend to throw people off. So, for example, next week we're going to talk about hell. Does the Bible literally say there is a hell? Do people without the Savior literally go and burn for eternity? Is that what the Bible teaches? We're going to talk about that next week. This week we're talking about a passage uh, that if you've read Luke 14, you come across and you're like, what? What in the world is he talking about? Um, you'll see what I mean in a minute. But here at The Rock, we do believe that the Bible, the Word of God, the Scriptures are literally the words of God, that God moved on His holy prophets and apostles and inspired them to write the Scriptures. Actually, if you go to our website and download our statement of faith, here's what we say about the Scripture. The Holy Bible and only the Bible is the authoritative Word of God. It alone is the final authority in determining all doctrinal truths. In its original writing, it is inspired, infallible, and inerrant. So when it comes to matters of ethics, morality, history, when it comes to biology, when it comes to philosophy, we look first and foremost to the Word of God. Now, there is a theological term, a discipline in um, theology known as hermeneutics. It sounds like a long word, but it simply means this. It's how we interpret the Scripture, hermeneutics. And it's the discipline of interpreting, the science of interpreting the Scripture. How do we understand what the Scripture says and, more importantly, maybe what it means? Let me do that. And the first law of hermeneutics or Bible interpretation is Scripture interprets Scripture. In other words, if you go to look for a, a passage, look at a passage of Scripture, what does that mean? The first place you go to look, if you don't understand the, what's going on right there in context, is you look at other Scriptures. Scripture interprets the Scripture. That's kind of the first law of hermeneutics. There's a little phrase that I learned in Bible school that I think is helpful, and it says this. A text, text of the Scripture, a verse in the Bible, without context, without looking at it in its original setting, who is it written by, to, for, where, what was the purpose, you know, without that context is only a pretext. In other words, you can pull a Scripture out of context and you can make it say almost anything you want to. So, you know, I've, the extreme example is, Judas went out and hanged himself. And you could find another scripture that says, go and do likewise. Well, if you pull it out of context, you can make the scripture say anything you want to. Well, that's not the point. If you look at a passage of scripture and take it out of its original setting, it's easy to make a faulty judgment about what that means. And so that's going to be important that we look at these texts over the next few weeks in context so we don't make it a pretext. Now, um, what Jesus talks about in our topic here I'm getting to is found in Luke chapter 14 and in Luke chapter 10. And as we're reading these verses, remember the context. He is talking to his disciples and to larger crowds, and he is talking about the cost of being a true follower of his. And I want to pull out a few different truths within these passages to help us understand what he's saying. So here's the difficult text. It's in Luke 14, but before I get there, here's the question we're going to be answering. 
do I need to hate my family to be fully committed to Christ? Do I need to hate my family to be fully committed to Christ? Now, the initial thought is, of course not. What a stupid thing to say. Uh, wait till you read the Scripture. Okay. There is a, here's the first point I'd like to make. There's a distinction between those in the crowd who merely follow Christ and those disciples who are fully committed to Christ. Keep that in mind as we look at this, these verses. Luke 14, 25 to 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And why was that? Because he was virtually eradicating sickness in, in the Judean countryside. Multitudes would come to him, and he would heal them all. People with tumors and ep epilepsy and cancers and all, they're just being healed all over the place. I mean, no, that's going to draw a crowd. Additionally, he was feeding people, hungry people that were coming to listen to his teaching that was different than any teaching they'd ever heard before because he taught with authority, not like one of the scribes or teachers of the law. And so he would meet their physical needs, healing, feed them. You heard the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 and the teaching. So they're being fed physically, spiritually. They're being healed. And so large crowds are following Jesus. And he turns to them. And you think in order to get a, keep a large crowd, you'd say something to make them feel good. But here's what I've learned about Jesus when you, when you read the teachings of Jesus, is Jesus would often say things to offend the head to reveal what was in a person's heart. This was a strategy in his teaching. And here's what he said. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now you understand why it's called a hard text. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now you think Jesus would have said the complete opposite. He, you think he would have said, if anyone comes to me and hates his family, you can't be my disciple. That would be the logical way to understand what he's saying, right? I mean, that's logical. But he says the complete opposite of that. What does he mean? After all, think about what we know about God. God is love, John said. The greatest commandment in all the Bible, love the Lord your God with all, all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And what's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul, in instructing the church at Ephesus, writing to Timothy, the pastor there, said, listen, if a man does not take care of his family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A deadbeat dad who claims to know Christ is worse than an unbeliever. That's what he's saying. We know that the fifth commandment, the Ten Commandments, right? The fifth one, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long upon the earth. Jesus even told us to love our enemies. So let me get this right. God, your love, I'm supposed to love you and my neighbor. I'm supposed to honor my parents. I am supposed to love my enemies, but I'm supposed to hate my family. I don't get it. What's he talking about? He's talking about the true cost of discipleship. There's a difference between a believer and a disciple. There's no such thing as an instant disciple. There might be instant oatmeal. But there's no instant disciple. That word disciple 
it implies there is discipline. A Russian comedian, Yakov Smirnov. The name's kind of funny to say, isn't it? Talks about when he first moved to America, he was amazed at the variety of instant products he could buy in the store. There's powdered milk. Just add water and poof, you got milk. It's nasty though, isn't it? <laughs> There's powdered orange juice. Just add a little water and you got tang. Orange juice. He's in the store one day and he looks and he sees baby powder. He's like, what a great country. <laughs> You want a baby, just add water, right? <laughs> you know, some people think that's, that's how discipleship works. When we were uh, pastoring the Rock down in the Portland area, it was so clear in my mind, this woman came, came to church. And um, she believed on the Lord Jesus. She, I want to accept Jesus. She gave her heart to the Lord. She went through our, at that time, we had a class similar to Growth Track. By the way, that happens at 11 today, if you'd like to learn more about our church. She got involved in that, and uh, she started serving. She was a greeter, even started bringing her kids and say, she's, it was great. I'm like, this is awesome. And then uh, we were talking about water baptism, which we do. We baptize people every single month here at The Rock, giving your whole life to Christ. You need to be water baptized, right? And so she said, sign me up. She got water baptized and never came back to church. You know why? In her mind, that's what it means to follow Jesus. You might serve some people, you believe in the Lord, but once you're water baptized, you check the religious box, I've done it, been there, done that. And that was her understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. Check off the boxes. I got it. A little water baptism, and poof, I'm a disciple of Jesus now. It takes more than water to make a disciple. Even though we are born into the kingdom of God through faith in Christ, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. A disciple takes time. Disciples are made, not born. In Luke 14, Jesus is getting closer and closer to the cross. He sees that his time on earth is winding to a close. His mission to go to the cross to pay for the sins of the world is going to be close upon it. He knows that suffering and persecution are coming. And he wants this large, large crowd that has been following to understand the way of the cross, the commitment that is required to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as he gives forth the cost of discipleship, I imagine many people said, you know what, I'm not willing to pay that. Same thing happened in John's gospel. Do you remember Jesus saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me? Large crowds following, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was with you till you start talking about cannibalism. Now I'm out. They tapped out. And most of the disciples left at that time. And Jesus looks at his 12, are you guys going to leave too? And what does Peter say? Where are we going? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus has the words of eternal life. And being a disciple of his, he's emphasizing here, requires total commitment. It's like the hog and the hen. The hog and the hen were sharing the same barnyard and they heard about the church's desire to feed the hungry. The hog and the hen discussed how they could help. What's my contribution? <laughs> it's my best hen <laughs> imitation right there. The hen says, I've got it. We'll provide bacon and eggs for the church to feed the hungry. Bacon and eggs. That's what we'll do. And the hog... Thinks about that for a minute. Then he says this. There's only one thing wrong, Hen, with your bacon and eggs idea. For you, it only requires a contribution. 
But for me, total commitment. Total commitment. That is the cost of discipleship. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else, he said, will be added unto you. And in Luke 14, we must remember Jesus is using a figure of speech, and he often did this. He used metaphors. Herod is a fox. Did he literally mean King Herod had a bushy tail and was red with paws? No. Similes, comparisons used in liking as. Parables, Jesus was famous for his stories. Paradoxes, which we're going to see one at the end today. And he used hyperbole. What's hyperbole? Hyperbole is an intentional exaggeration to emphasize a point. And I would submit to you that Luke 14 is hyperbole. Mothers, if you have sons, you've used hyperbole. Son, I have told you a million times to put the toilet seat down after you're done, right? Now, have you literally told them a million times? Probably not. Probably more like a half a million. Not quite a million. What you exaggerate to make a point. We all, at different times, use hyperbole. So don't get upset at Jesus for saying, you've got to hate every, you know, your family. He's making a point here. In Jesus 10, uh, Matthew 10, rather, Jesus does say this, though. It doesn't get any easier than this. Distinction is made between following Christ and a full commitment to Christ. And secondly, a full commitment to Christ may, in fact, cause division in your family. Here's where he doesn't soften it any. Here's where he just tells you the truth. Matthew 10, 34 to 37. Jesus said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Did you suppose that? Did you suppose right now on this earth that when you come to Jesus Christ, who is known as the Prince of Peace, that everything externally in your life, all your relationships, everything is just going to be at peace? No. The peace is in here. It's not going to be out here, at least not now. And what happens? I did not come to bring peace, he said. I came to bring a sword. What does a sword do? A sword divides, a sword cuts, a sword wounds. And the verse 35 is what's startling. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me, oh, that's what he's talking about, is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I've seen this over the years many times where a beloved child will get into a sinful relationship because of fear or because the parent loves the child. Instead of standing for truth and God's righteousness, they give them a pass. They don't hold to the truth of the Scripture because they love their child and they don't want to offend them and they don't want to break that relationship, and so they accept their sinful lifestyle. Listen, to be a disciple means you must love Jesus more than you love anyone else, even your family members. Your love for Jesus should be so powerful that in comparison, it seems as if you hate everyone else. Jesus said a man's enemies will be members of his own household. Sometimes our love for Jesus will alienate us from others and even your own family. And I know there's many in here 
as I've known you over the years, and I've seen it in your own family, your commitment to Christ cost you your marriage, cost a relationship with your child. When God calls us, we have to make some difficult decisions. And sometimes our family criticizes us, and sometimes they reject us. And being a Christian and following Jesus Christ may mean that you've created a division in your own home. Remember uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 61 to 62. This guy comes along, and he's following Jesus. I mean, he's seeing the miracles. He's hearing the teaching. And he's like, sign me up. I believe you are the Son of God. I want to follow you too, Jesus. I want to be one of your disciples. Let me do this first, though. Let me go home and let me bid farewell to my family. You know how Jesus answers that? He said this, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. Let me interpret that for you. Paraphrase. She said to this guy, I'm not going to accept you. You're too attached to your family. You're never going to make the break. You're never willing to pay the price to be a fully committed follower of mine. I've seen wives not continue to serve God for fear of separation from their husbands. They're more afraid of what their husband will think about them or how they'll treat them if they come to Christ. I've seen the other way where husbands, they don't fully commit to Christ because their wives don't buy in. Well, I've already mentioned the children. Some people will not take a stand for Christ. Listen to this. Some people will not take a stand for Christ because they want to maintain their family's unity. Now, there's nothing wrong with family unity. Have it if you can. But there are times you can't. And what are you going to do? I want to encourage you to have an eternal perspective on family. Live for Christ yourself. Fully commit your life to the kingdom. Pray for your loved ones that may be in opposition to you. But don't compromise your faith. Don't stop following the Lord wholeheartedly if they don't agree. For the true disciple, it's not always, thank God, it's not always the case. But sometimes you must forsake your family if need be. And that almost sounds like wrong. I would never do that. I could never do that. And then you're not fit for the kingdom. Becoming a Christian is affirming your commitment to the lordship of Christ to the point where he is literally our Lord. We forsake everything else to follow him. Discipleship isn't just sticking up your hand or filling out a commitment card or walking down an aisle or saying, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus. Salvation is by faith, not by works. But the manifestation of true faith, the manifestation of true faith, the manifestation of true faith is a commitment that cannot be swayed by any influence, including those closest to you. Of course you're going to love your family. Of course you're to love your spouse. Of course you're to love your children and your parents and your husband and your wife and those that are closest to you. But if your commitment is to Christ, you're a real follower of His, a disciple of Christ. And your commitment to Him is so deep and, pro and so profound and so far-reaching that you will say no to your family for the cause of Christ, if need be. where it gets heavy on a November morning, doesn't it? But nonetheless, it's important. What kind of followers are we? We just want hell insurance? How I like to be liked, you know, I'm selling hell insurance. No. Jesus Wants your heart. Think about this. The creator of the universe, the most important thing that he says that I want from you 
the most important commandment in all the Bible is your love. That's what the Bible says from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, all the way to Matthew 22, where Jesus explains the greatest commandment is God wants your love. And how do you prove to God that you love Him? What did Jesus say in John's gospel? If you obey me, if you obey my commandments, you love me. That's how we know. That's how He knows. That's how we know. Final thought to consider. A full commitment to Christ will require sacrifice. Now, if your family's on board the way you are, maybe that's not the sacrifice. But there's a cross. The cross is where Jesus paid for our sins, but the cross is also to be a way of life for the believer, a dying to self. Matthew 10, 38, Jesus said, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In Luke 14, 27, he said the same thing. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What's the point? The point is to stress total self-denial, total self-denial to the point of even death. What's your cross? Where's the point where you say, no, this is my life, God. You can't have that. I'm going to do this my way. For some people, it's their wallet. For some people, it's their sexuality. For some people, it's their career. Committing your life to follow Jesus Christ does mean that you would not only forsake your family if need be, you would lose your life. That's the extent of the commitment. That's the mark of genuineness. The love of Christ has to overrule the normality of family love, and the love of Christ has to overrule the instinct of self-preservation. Can I tell you, there is a tremendous blessing attached to that kind of commitment to our Lord. I want to end with a paradox. This is to continue what he said in Matthew 10. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Has your faith ever cost you that? If you're willing to lose your life for my sake, you'll really find eternal life in the end. Doesn't mean you get saved by being a martyr, although that may be required. It means you're a genuine follower of Jesus. I'll close with a story. Back in the 90s, after the wall came down, and they allowed Americans to go to Russia. I was able to go on a uh, mission trip to Russia. And we took a train from Moscow, 22 hours, to the Ural Mountains, where, which is the border. Russia, of course, the largest land country in the, in the world, followed by Canada. And to the east of the Ural Mountains is Asia, and to the west is Europe. So we were in a little city, well, not that little, over a million people called Perm there. And there was a pastor who was, had started a Bible school. And what struck me was uh, the poverty of the people. It was, it was interesting in, in those days. They were very well-educated people, but they were very poor. That's what communism had done to them over decades. And, um, this pastor was bold enough in the face of the Russian Orthodox Church and persecution. And my translator, his family had spent 
time in prison for preaching the gospel in Russia in those days. His name was Misha. And Pastor Edward was the guy's name. And he had this Bible school in this rundown little building. And I remember they asked me to speak at this Bible school. I'm a young American, you know, and uh, really never had any kind of, well, there's persecution a little bit, but not like these people. And I forget, I got up and I talked about um, the ministry, the purpose of the ministry, the price, and then the prize, you know, the eternal rewards as a result. And I remember when I was hitting the, um, the price, you know, talking about all those who live God- godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution and, you know, just talking through that. And so I get to the end of that little message. And I'm forgetting, looking at the, at the people in that dingy, lit, little Bible school. And this one man lifts up his hand, says, uh, you know, I, I can't remember how long it took him to get there, just to that school and the price he had paid and the suffering he had gone through. And he said, uh, you're talking about the price following the Lord in ministry. He said, what does it cost you? And I just remember looking at him. I had nothing to say. I'm like, I'm just an arrogant young man talking about things that I haven't really fully experienced. Since then, I think I've had a few trials a few more. But what does it cost you to follow Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ many of us have claimed, is our Lord. And Jesus, you endured suffering. You learned obedience through the things you suffered. And that's how we learn obedience. Lord, there, there are those that have suffered here greatly, given up careers, endured insults, lost family members at odds with the people that were closest to them because they have followed you and their convictions in you. Bless them, Lord, with grace, with peace, with your presence. Father, there may be others of us here that you've compromised but we know in our hearts what we should do. But we weren't willing to pay that price. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us for Christ's sake. Forgive us, Lord, and give us another opportunity to show our love to you. And Father, there may be some here that have never called on the name of the Lord. Now they believe They haven't surrendered their life. They haven't committed fully to you. Lord, if if they're here today, I pray by your spirit that you would draw them to yourself. And if that's you, friend, I invite you to pray with me right now. Just pray these simple words. God in heaven, I acknowledge that I am sinful, that I have broken your commandments, and that I need a Savior. Teach me how to love you, how to follow you, because I want to commit my life to you, to the truth. And I want that gift of eternal life. I want to lose my life that I may find it for your sake. And I ask this, all these things, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who bore the cross for us, and set the example for us. The one who is worthy of 
everything that we have. We bless your name, Jesus. Amen.